Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. This encounter happened around the fall of last year. I was staying with my grandparents for the weekend. They live in a more rural area of my hometown, away from the center of town, and near a more wooded area. This weekend, my grandpa happened to be away camping. He and my uncle owned a camp and would usually go fishing and camp throughout the summer and fall. This meant it was just me, my grandma, and my younger sister. Usually, this wouldn't matter much, but I would have felt much safer having my grandfather around in this case. There is a field across the road from my grandparents' home, surrounded by woods and a few other homes. My sister and I were playing badminton in the front yard when my grandmother suggested that we take a walk through the field. Now, I'm not one to enjoy being out in the woods, so I guess you could say I might have been against going into the wilderness, but I swear, something felt entirely off. As we walked throughout the field, my sister and grandmother pushed ahead as I lagged along observing my surroundings. As I said before, I felt something was off. I was so caught up in watching the area around me that I didn't notice my sister throwing rocks into the tall bushes in the field. My stomach immediately dropped. I have no idea why, but I got an intense feeling of dread in my stomach. Now, let me mention that these are large bushes something or someone could easily hide in. I ran up to my sister, begging her to stop throwing the rocks, and asked my grandmother to go back home. My stomach was in knots. I had no idea why I had reacted like that over something as stupid as throwing rocks. My grandmother had noticed my discomfort and prompted us to walk back to the house. On our way back, my sister threw one last rock into the brush before crossing the road, and at that moment, you could hear a low growl. I felt like I was going to throw up. The feeling of dread in my stomach was becoming more and more prominent. I asked, did you hear that? As we crossed the road, both of them shook their heads no, saying they hadn't heard anything. I must have looked pretty shaken up because my grandma started to try and calm me down, convincing me I was probably hearing things. After a while, I began to calm down, but still felt a bit on edge. We stayed in the front yard with my grandmother playing badminton, but I couldn't shake the feeling we were being watched. I started to look around, and that's when I heard it. Voices. It sounded like two men talking. I strained my ears to try to make out what was being said, but to no avail. I looked around to see if the neighbors might have been on their lawn as they were really the only other people around. There was no one there. My grandma noticed me looking around and asked, you can hear that too? She can also hear the whispers. We both began to look around and the noises stopped. I felt uncomfortable and began to walk inside. The whole night, strange sounds came from outside the house. Nothing aggressive, but odd. I don't even know how to describe it. Just lots of ruckus. I was terrified the whole night. I've only told very few people about this encounter. I speculate my family was being stalked by a Bigfoot. On to the next one. In Grimsby, in Ontario, my then boyfriend and I were out for an evening drive up an escarpment. It was about 9.30 p.m. and the sun, as I recall, had gone down. Because we were using the headlight, we were leisurely driving along. I don't really recall being engaged in conversation at that moment because we were both looking ahead in front of us. All of a sudden, this thing just ran across the road in front of our car. My boyfriend had to slam on the brakes, otherwise he would have hit it dead on. We swerved and missed it by six inches and almost ended up in a ditch. As soon as the car came to a complete stop, we just looked at each other in total disbelief and said, what was that? As stupid as it might sound, this thing was a Bigfoot. 
There is no other way to describe it. As it ran across the road, it turned to its left and looked directly at us. And as the car swerved, it ran into the forest. I mean, we got a clear view of it. This thing was right in front of us, running across the road. Actually, I think we had our high beams on because where we were driving was all farm country and wooded area and didn't have any street lights. I've never talked to anyone about this other than my then boyfriend, who I've lost touch with over the years, and my husband. I think if I tell someone, they'll think I've completely lost it. I can't believe it myself. I mean, how do you tell someone you just saw Bigfoot and then get a response like, go on, you're joking, right? And although we were both young at the time, we were stone sober. Not one ounce of alcohol or drugs of any type. So that's my story. The only reason I'm telling it is that I saw a special the other night about Bigfoot and wondered if there had been any sightings in Canada. Check the internet, and to my amazement, there were actual sightings in the same area where I lived. There was only one other witness than myself. The witness was driving the car, and I was the passenger. We were just looking out the front windshield of the car, not in conversation at the time. It was a beautiful, calm evening, about 9.30 p.m. The sun had gone down. I know the approximate time, because once we were over the shock and discussed it for a while and got the heck out of Dodge, we wondered what time it was getting to be. It was almost 10 p.m. It was a wooded area on the left-hand side of the road, farmlands to the right. Can't recall any landmark. Was in shock afterward, so my mind is blank after it happened. I don't even know how we made it home. We were shaking so much. On to the next one. My old army buddy, David, and I hadn't seen each other for five years when we ended up at the same treatment center in Deming, New Mexico. We had been close friends during two overseas tours of duty and had both been exposed to a chemical weapons attack one night as we slept. That ended our last tour. And after treatment for a month there, I won't mention the country as we were part of a secret operation and it will always remain so by law. We were returned to the state and we went to our respective home. I in Indiana and David's roots were in New Mexico. David is of Navajo blood and although his father was only half, most of the relatives he knows reside in New Mexico. I had never been in New Mexico before, but I was participating in a rather experimental medical procedure that was being conducted in Deming due to the dry climate. We had both transferred out of our respective treatment centers to participate in the small-scale trial, and we found ourselves among a group of only 16 other men. David and I recognized each other immediately, and we made sure we would be together for this treatment period. After catching up on old times, and reliving the eight years we had been in the same unit, we fell into a routine of treatments and light exercise regimes. David, being a close friend, I had hesitated for a long time to even tell this story in fear of disparaging my best friend. Since Dave is gone now, I feel that it is my duty to tell of the evil we experienced. It is well known that the native people have an almost non-tolerance of alcohol. Dave was no different, but I never tried to chastise him for it, but rather I had often covered for him when we were in the active military, and now that we were back together, it was just like old times. It turned out that his only family remaining in this area was an uncle and a sister. So after a couple of courtesy visits, it sure wasn't like old times. Dave and I spent time on the pool tables, in bars, and took a few hikes. One evening, in a local pool hall, Dave ran into an old friend he had not seen since he was in high school. His friend, Rick, was working for a local auto dealership selling cars. We got together several more times, and one night, after hard partying, Rick grew pensive. He quietly invited us to go outside as he had something very important to share with us. We went out to the parking lot, and that's when Rick invited us to accompany him to what he said 
was a shape-shifter ceremony. Dave was suddenly excited, and I just stood there with my mouth shut until Dave said he'd heard about these ceremonies all his life, and he was very interested in going to it. We shook hands all around like making a secret pact, and we agreed to never discuss what we were about to witness. I have no idea how Rick was able to get us into what Dave had said was a highly secretive group. Rick just laughed and told me if they were all drunk enough and because I had dark enough features, they'd think I was a brother. We piled in Rick's pickup and headed out toward the desert. We must have driven over 30 miles and it was past sunset, but the light lingered to allow us to make good time toward the distant mesas that loomed before us. Rick had brought a bottle of whiskey, which we kept passing around. Soon, we were feeling no pain. Finally, Rick turned off a less-traveled road that seemed to worsen the further we drove. We had gone about ten miles with Rick carefully watching the road. He suddenly turned left onto what seemed like two ruts in the sand, and it was necessarily to reduce our speed to about five miles per hour due to the up and down track we were on. Finally, after another mile or so, we came to a flat area where about 12 vehicles were parked. Most were trucks, but I saw about five dirt bikes. We located the truck and Rick brought the whiskey bottle as we walked down a clearly visible trail, passing a shotgun holding man who shined a flashlight in our faces, but gave us the nod when he recognized Rick. Both Dave and I were really in suspense, and Dave said even though he was raised here and had heard about these ceremonies, he had never attended one, nor had he any real knowledge of the skinwalkers or shapeshifter witches that Rick seemed so familiar with. A short walk brought us to a large campfire which was fueled by wood, obviously hauled in as there were no trees in this entire canyon. Being as how Dave and I were not members of this group, Rick had secured permission for us to attend the ceremony, and before we were allowed to proceed to a seat, two of the armed members put us through a series of questions and followed up with a warning that if we ever disclosed what we were about to see to anyone, we would meet with a painful death. We could tell they were serious, so we readily agreed, because by now, we were half drunk and open to most anything. Looking around, I would bet there wasn't a sober man here. Since this happened so long ago, I finally dare after 30 years to tell about it. Since I'm getting long in the tooth and likely about the youngest one in attendance that night, I think I'm safe. The heavy drinking I had been doing had surely clouded my senses, but the ceremony seemed to be well regulated a certain chant and words were spoken by the host and quickly repeated by those in attendance, so this must have been a regular occurrence. Obviously, following a pre-planned regimen, Rick was called on by the moderator and he stepped into the center of the circle. A sort of shawl made out of what appeared to be animal skin sewn together into a cape-like garment was placed around his shoulders and then he danced around the circle chanting words I couldn't understand or even recall when Dave and I discussed it the next day. Rick had explained that their tribe's traditional guardians of the spiritual world were witches called Yi Naldoshi, which I have since researched to see that they are as much evil witches as they are protectors. I found it hard to understand how the people who must attend these ceremonies can accept or understand all the significance and the mysticism contained within all of the chant and dancing. Even though it all seemed to follow a ritualistic pattern, I had to wonder how anyone could memorize so much as it did seem like they were all in sync, right in the middle of a major part of chanting by all of the participants, Rick threw some sort of a powder into a large fire, which exploded into a huge cloud of smoke, and suddenly there was a large seven-foot creature standing there that looked like a giant feather-covered praying mantis with a wolfish face, and Rick had disappeared. 
Both Dave and I looked at each other with jaws open and in total bewilderment. Neither of us could speak, and as we discussed afterward, we were blown away. We sat for several minutes watching this creature wildly dance to the sound of the drums being beaten in rhythm by the attendees, and the scrawny beast came up close to each person around the circle, Neither Dave nor I could see any remote resemblance between the scraggly being and our lost friend Rick. Suddenly, we were again assaulted with a huge explosion of smoke that completely smothered every one of us. And when the smoke dissipated, there was Rick, still dancing as though he had never left. I never did understand the significance of the changing of Rick into this other creature or where he was when it was there. Rick hardly spoke on our drive back to town. It was like he was completely exhausted. And when I tried to ask him how he changed into a creature that looked nothing like him, he just mumbled later. Dave and I exchanged looks that we both understood to mean we'd let it go for now. The next day, Dave and I had more time off. And it was then that we were sitting at an outside patio drinking beer and Dave filled me in on more of his people's mysterious shapeshifters. In low tones, Dave took me into his confidence and explained about the evil witches called skinwalkers. Although I had previously heard about these evil witches, Dave told me about the significance of the shapeshifter. In order for a skinwalker or a shapeshifter to perform his many traits and evil acts, he needed the ability to change into other animals. It seems that these witches dated back to the Spanish soldiers who had conquered Mexico and had made raids into what are now New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah to kidnap the native people for slaves in the silver mine. As a self-defense, the gods created these witches called skinwalkers and shapeshifters. These witches had the ability to change themselves into other animals and could sneak into Spanish camps to ascertain their plans and then change back into other creatures to combat the invaders, and when back in the form of the skinwalker, they would supposedly murder indiscriminately. The shape-shifting ability allowed them to become deer, where he can now outrun most other animals as he needs. He can change into a crow and just fly away. On the other hand, becoming a wolf will enable him to make a kill, and then change into other convenient animals to make his escape. Our schedule demanded that Dave and I return to a more intensive treatment so we did not have a break for the next two weeks. And then the treatment phase was complete. So we had to part ways and get back to our base treatment facility at home. A week before we left, Dave tried repeatedly to get in touch with Rick, but couldn't reach him. And then Dave called me and said he just heard that Rick's body had been found about four miles east of town in a ravine. It appeared that he was hit by a vehicle, but the only record of an accident reported in that area was a family that had hit a deer at night, and there were two other cars as witnesses. The police officer had taken the dead animal off the highway and pushed it over the cliff into a shallow gorge below. It was two days later when a hiker found Rick's body in the same area, but there was no sign of any deer. The officer looked for it as he was the same deputy to respond to both reports. Dave and I looked at each other and were speechless. I've always wondered if it had been possible that Rick had been killed while in the form of a deer, and then his body changed back again. But Dave didn't wish to discuss it further, and when I pressed him on it, his answer was, I think it's best that we just let it lie. He also commented that any further discussion would break the promise we made, and if these beings have that kind of power, we might be taking a big risk. I nodded at him, and we shook hands and let it go. On to the next one. My name is Abby, and I can't walk, but I get around pretty well in my sport wheelchair and my modified van. There was a time when I was younger that I felt sorry for myself, but if I were able to walk, I wouldn't have had the unique glimpse of another world that I had. 
a world few have ever seen. I was born with a birth defect of the spinal cord. For a lot of my early life, I lived in a very sheltered space, both mentally and physically. My parents took good care of me, but they worried about me more than they should have and overly sheltered me. If they could see me now, they would be either very proud or would die of worry. My parents died when I was in my teens, and I ended up in a residential school for the disabled called Alpine School, which was near a ski area in Utah. My whole life turned around at that point, as I'm sure you can imagine. When I went to live at the school, I was no longer treated like an invalid, and I was expected to do things and take care of myself. It was a really hard time for me, but it also made me grow as a person. I saw myself blossom into a new life like a butterfly. Part of my new life included doing things outside, which was a first for me. My parents would take me for car rides or let me sit out in the patio, but actually doing anything that involved physical activity was never even considered. Oh, sure, once in a while we would go for a walk, but then only down the sidewalk near the house with my dad pushing my wheelchair. My parents loved me, but they didn't understand what I could really do. And when I met Aaron, my life changed even more. He was new to the school, and he was turning the place upside down, but in a good way. Aaron was 15, and his parents had brought him to live with us for a while because they weren't sure what to do with him and feared for his safety. And maybe rightly so. He was only there for a few months, then went back home. But in that short time, he had a profound effect on me. Aaron wanted to be an athlete, which is pretty difficult for someone who's stuck in a wheelchair. People who can walk take things for granted that are huge for someone in a wheelchair. Aaron was a skateboarder who had recently permanently injured himself and was now a paraplegic like me, with no use of his legs. This was really hard on him and he vowed to not let it slow him down. And man, he didn't. The school we were in encouraged us to live to our best abilities, but they hadn't reckoned with someone like Aaron. First, he would sneak out and go down to the nearest park and hang out. Aaron missed his buddies and being in his old school, and that was just the start of the things he would do. Aaron wanted to be back on his skateboard, and he couldn't, so he just started using his wheelchair like a skateboard, riding up and down the skate park in it. He ended up becoming a local hero and could do all kinds of tricks in that wheelchair. He finally got a custom-made wheelchair and ended up going home and back to his regular school and then on to college. So Aaron wasn't around very long, but he really inspired me. The more I got to do things outdoors, the more I loved nature, and I wanted to be outdoors. I decided I wanted to be a landscape and wildlife photographer, and I know that sounds hard for someone in a wheelchair, but that's exactly what I ended up doing. That's how I make my living today, and people don't know I'm disabled when they see my photos. All of this is relevant to my story, so bear with me. The more I was around Aaron, the more I saw what I could do, and I too started sneaking off. But instead of going to the park, I would go over to the nearby waterfowl refuge. I was supposed to be in a class in the art building, but I told my teachers I dropped it, and the people who were in charge of my whereabouts all thought I was over doing art, so nobody noticed I was gone. I would wheel over across the background to the art building, then veer off down a dirt trail that connected with a beautiful boardwalk that traversed the wildlife sanctuary, which was next to our school. The sanctuary was a beautiful place, and I just loved going over there and sitting and watching the birds. The boardwalk wound around through the refuge with places where you could stop and rest on a bench or even hide in a blind to watch the birds. It was on the edge of a large wetland, 
and there were places the boardwalk went right over the shallow water. If you sat there really quietly, sometimes ducks would float right up to you. It was so cool, and I loved that place. But I never got to stay very long at a time. I never saw anyone over there. Well, every evening, I could hear the ducks and geese making a racket before they settled in for the night. And I knew the sunset over there would be fabulous, much better than out my window, where everything was blocked by nearby buildings. I really wanted to go over there in the evening and see what the refuge looked like. One evening after dinner, I was just sitting there when Aaron came rolling by. This was only a few days before they sent him back home, saying he didn't need to be there anymore. We started talking and I told him what I wanted to do, and he said we should just go do it. So the two of us ended up sneaking over to the refuge and hanging out until it was almost dark. We had a great time, and nobody even missed us. Aaron was really an inspiration. Nothing stopped him. A few days later, the itch to go over there hit me again. It was such a perfect place, so quiet and so far away from all my problems. When I was over there, I forgot my life was different and that I couldn't walk. The outdoors does that to me. It makes me feel whole. So I snuck off again. Seems like after dinner and before bedtime was a good time, as nobody really checked up on me. I was soon over at the boardwalk, watching the sunset and listening to all the birds. I had a little flashlight with me, so I wasn't worried about getting home. But... All of a sudden, it got totally still. All sound ceased. No frogs, no birds, no crickets, nothing. This was a first for me, and I wondered why. What would cause everyone to be quiet all of a sudden? Remember that I had hardly ever even been outdoors when this happened, so I didn't realize how totally unusual it was. I just figured that at a certain time of day, everyone got quiet. It didn't seem ominous or anything to me. I sat there for a while, then decided it was getting dark enough. I should probably head back while I could still see and before I was missing. Just as I turned to go, I noticed a small movement in the thick brush over to my left, kind of where the shoreline was. It didn't look like a bird, and I was kind of startled as it hadn't even occurred to me that there might be other creatures in there. I stopped and looked really hard, but couldn't make anything out, so I kept going. But as I got further down the boardwalk, back toward the school, I could now hear something following along behind me. It made the boardwalk shake a little, and I could hear its footsteps, though they were muffled by the wood, but it was like something that was barefoot. I turned around, but couldn't see anything, so I continued on. I was soon on the little dirt path and back over to the school. I ran into Aaron in the hall, and he stopped and told me he was leaving. So I forgot all about what had happened, as I hated to see him go. I later thought about it and decided there were deer over there. Well, it was a few more days before I went back. I had now acquired a small camera from Aaron, who gave me his little pocket single shot as a gift when he left, and I was anxious to go see if I could get some sunset photos. It was the start of my photography career, though I didn't know that. I can't tell you how excited I was. I had just turned 16, I had a camera for the first time, and I was discovering my freedom. I rolled out right after dinner and straight for the refuge to shoot the sunset. I remember checking out the clouds all day to see if it would be a good sunset display and thinking it would. I don't remember if I got any pictures or not as things changed so quickly. And I forgot all about the sunset. It was a bit later than usual as we'd had dinner late for some reason. I do remember that. And I was very aware of how the shadows were getting long as I wondered if they'd make interesting pictures but I don't recall much after that other than sitting there in my wheelchair next to a bird blind by the boardwalk.
and being very scared. I took some photos, then wheeled on down the boardwalk a ways to a bird blind, hoping to see some evening birds. But as I sat there, I could hear that something really large was coming up the boardwalk directly towards me. I knew it was large because I could make out its shadow, even though I couldn't actually see it because the blind was blocking my view. I assumed it couldn't see me, and I was desperately trying to figure out how to either hide or run away, both of which were impossible. Then I realized that this was the same thing I had heard previously and had mistaken for a deer. I also remember noting how deathly still it was all around me, just like the previous time. And I will admit, the thought ran through my mind that I had been very foolish to think that I could lead a somewhat normal life, like other kids my age. All these thoughts went through my mind as I sat there, terrified. It was dusk, and as I sat there, this huge thing walked right up to the blind I was behind. Did it know I was there? It had to. What was it? I had no idea. Know enough about the local wildlife to even guess, but I knew it wasn't human. Now, it began to make a snuffling noise, like it could smell me, but wasn't sure what to think. Next, I heard a high sort of chatter, then a low growling sound, all which lasted only seconds. It was like someone was talking. There must be two of them. I felt more and more frightened, if possible, but when a huge, dark, hairy head slowly looked around the edge of the blind, I almost fainted. There was nothing I could do but sit there. I wish now I'd taken some photos, but I was too scared during all this to even remember I had a camera. Now this thing stepped around to where it was in full view, and it had a young one with it. I remember well what it looked like. It was massive and had dark, longish hair that appeared to be very well-groomed, not all matted or dirty. It had a musky smell, kind of like a wet dog, but more swampy smelling. Its arms were very long, and its eyes were very intelligent. My overall impression was that it was more ape-like than animal-like, if that makes any sense. It had skin showing around its eyes and cheeks and mouth, and the skin was gray, even though the hair was dark brown, it had a broad forehead. The baby was just like it, with shorter hair and, of course, much smaller. It was cute in an ugly way, or you could also say ugly in a cute way. It clung to its mama's leg. At least, I assume it was the mama and not the dad. They both stood there, looking at me, and I began to understand how zoo animals must feel, being stared at by other species, captive and unable to get away. They weren't more than five feet away from me, almost close enough they could reach out and touch me. And that's exactly what they did. The big one, who I later decided must be the mom, slowly reached her hand over towards me. I thought, okay, here we go. This is the end. And I just sat very still. But she reached out and touched the wheels of my wheelchair. Then, quickly jerked her hand back. Well, I didn't do anything. When I didn't do anything, she reached out again and touched the spokes. Then the tires. It was as if she was trying to figure out what it was. I started to relax a bit, though still terrified, as I began to think maybe whatever these things were, they were just curious and very brave to come up to a human and reach out like that. I later decided they somehow knew I wasn't a threat, that I wasn't like other humans. Now, the little one reached out and touched my wheel, then my leg. I'll never forget the look on its face. It must have realized I was something alive from the feel of my leg. It jumped and hid behind its mom. It was actually kind of cute, though at the time I was too scared to appreciate it. I felt less fear, so I said something like, I won't eat you if you won't eat me, something dumb like that, as if they could understand me, and as if I could harm them if I wanted to. This made the little one stay behind the mom, and the mom backed slowly away, then turned, 
picked up the youngster and walked back down the boardwalk. It reminded me of some wild animal that has never seen a human, how they might act, cautious but curious. This all happened much faster than I can even tell, and there I sat, alone again. It was nearly dark, so I got out of there and back as fast as I possibly could. I wanted so badly to talk to Aaron, but he was gone, and there was no one else around to talk to. What were these things? Where did they come from? Would they harm me if I went back? Was I stupid enough to go back? I slept very little that night. Now, given the internet, I would have known right away they were Bigfoot. But this was before one could just turn on their computer and research such things. The next day, I couldn't eat, and I felt very anxious. I kept thinking I was going insane and hadn't seen anything at all just imagined it. I wanted to go back, but I was too scared. I felt like a tornado had mixed up my brain and nothing felt the same. I stayed in that night with the curtains on my windows closed and listening to music, trying to regain some normalcy. But I couldn't sleep again, and I was a wreck. It was about two or three in the morning when I got up, pulled myself into my wheelchair and started down the hall. I had to go back and see if these things were real or if I was going nuts. That shows you the state of mind I was in, to want to go back over there in the middle of the night. But I was feeling desperate. It was probably a good thing, but all the doors were locked. I finally got back into my bed and went to sleep for a few hours. The next day, I hatched a plan. If I had really seen these creatures, they seemed like they weren't interested in harming me, so why not see if I could make friends with them? I snuck into the kitchen and stole a bag of apples, hiding it under my shirt tail, then taking it back into my room. After dinner, I was off. I went straight to the blind where I'd seen them before and waited until it was dusk. When everything suddenly went quiet, I knew they were back which terrified me and made me wonder why I was so stupid as to be back over there again. I couldn't see nor hear them, but I knew they were there. I opened the bag of apples and slowly dropped them one by one into a small pile, then rolled back away and waited. It wasn't long until they were back. The mom and her little one who was riding on her big hip. The mom stooped down and picked up an apple and took a bite then ate it in one chomp. She then gave one to the little one, who ate it in two bites. They devoured that small bag of apples in just a couple of minutes. I wasn't brave enough to stick around, so I took off as fast as I could, every once in a while looking over my shoulder to see if I was being followed. I was soon back to the school, only to discover I'd been locked out. Someone had done the lockdown early. Oh man, I was up the creek. My freedom was probably about to end. I had two choices, spend the night outside and hope nobody missed me, or yell for help and bang on the door. I suddenly thought of Aaron. What would he do? No way he would risk losing his freedom. I decided to stay outside all night. It was summer, and I sure wouldn't freeze or anything. I rolled my chair over into the patio where I couldn't be seen, then sat there thinking about everything. I knew it would be a long, uncomfortable night sitting in that chair, but I didn't care. I had actually never spent one night of my life outside, and I was curious as to what it would be like. As I sat there, the night sky opened up, and I saw the stars in all their beauty for the first time in my life. I had no idea they were even there, not like that anyway layer after layer of jewels hanging there. It was incredible. I thought of the creatures I'd seen over in the refuge and wondered what they were and what their lives were like. I decided I would continue to take them food when I could. The next thing I knew, it was dawn, and I slept like a baby with my head kind of leaning against the chair back, not too uncomfortable. I'd never seen the sunrise, and there it was a real fireball. 
I felt like my life had just begun with all these new miracles. As I sat there, waiting for someone to unlock the door so I could sneak back in, I heard a call from the refuge, and somehow I felt it was just for me. It was a long, drawn-out whooping that would have scared me to death normally. But instead, it seemed like a good morning call. It was really different, though, as it sounded like it was made of two tones at once, a high and a low one. I wanted to whoop back, but I knew someone would hear me inside and I'd be caught. In retrospect, it must have been a farewell whoop, as I never saw the pair again. Even though I went over there a number of times, I did finally get caught and had my freedom curtailed, but it wasn't long after before I graduated from Alpine School and was accepted into a photography school where I could follow my dreams. I even got a scholarship. I've often wondered if somewhere out there deep in the wild forest, a Bigfoot sometimes thinks of her childhood and wonders if it was all a dream or if her mom actually did take her right up to a human one where she reached out and touched it. On to the next one. I came across many interesting people in my travels and while researching. One such character was an elderly gentleman that lived in the Kiamichi Mountains of southern Oklahoma. His name was Sam. Sam was a full-blood Cherokee born and raised in Oklahoma. His family was originally from a small community just outside of Sally Saw called Nikut. Sam taught me how to pronounce his Cherokee name and the meaning behind it. Though I wrote it down many years ago, I'm not sure if I have the spelling correct and I do not possess the font type to spell it out in its original form. The meaning was relatively simple and, as he pointed out, not very interesting. When he was a young boy, he was thrown from a horse and suffered a leg injury. Though it was temporary, he walked with a slight limp for most of that summer. Sam fashioned a cane out of a small limb to use while he recovered. His grandmother called him what roughly translates to walks with a stick. In his later years, as when I knew him, he used a cane most of the time to get around. He said the injury never bothered him growing up, and he could still run just as fast as any of the other boys, but the limp became more pronounced when he was much older. Sam was in his mid-70s, but I would not have guessed him older than 50 to 55 at most. His mind was as sharp as a tack, and the sparkle in his eyes when he smiled gave not a hint of being any older. He had a few wrinkles and was going as strong as any man I'd ever know. His hands were big and calloused from years of hard work, but now crimped from arthritis. It wasn't until I had known him a while and shared stories with him that I learned his actual age. He credited his youthful appearance to living a simple life. He went to water every day regardless of the weather. He was grateful for everything the creator had given him. Sam married when he was a young man, and together they raised two boys. I never had the pleasure of meeting his family, though I felt like I knew them just from Sam's stories he shared with me. His wife had passed on, and his sons had both married and moved away. Though they often visited when they were younger, those visits had decreased through the years, and I think it weighed on Sam's heart. He was lonely. I loved hearing Sam's stories. He had some of the best, and I could sit and listen to him talk all night long. His smooth, baritone voice never cracked, and his rhythm and cadence were perfect. We always begin by building a small fire in the backyard to enjoy the evening air when I visited. Sometimes he would break out in song. It would be in his first language, so he would tell me a little about it when he finished and explained he was praising the creator for something. Sam was a fascinating gentleman, a proud Cherokee who lived primarily traditional. I say mostly because even though he was a full-blood, a first-language speaker, lived a simple life, and practiced the old ways, he still embraced the modern world. He enjoyed watching TV, and he loved ice cream. He kept his freezer full of it. 
as we visited in his kitchen late one evening. He turned, grabbed my hand, and stared into my eyes without saying a word for the longest time. It seemed like he was looking inside me, into my very soul. Perhaps it was to see if he could trust me with a story. He had never done this before. Finally, he turned and walked outside and motioned for me to follow. He asked me to gather some wood and build a fire. He sat down, propped his hand-carved cane down on his chair, and waited patiently. When the fire was blazing, he asked me to sit across from him. He said, I have a story to share with you. I could tell whatever he wanted to share with me was something of considerable weight, just the way he was acting. He wasn't his usual light-hearted self. He was more earnest and thoughtful. What he told me was one of the most exciting stories I'd ever heard. This is a true story that happened many years ago, Sam said, slowly drawing his words out. I sat down across from him with great anticipation. He took his time. I remember thinking at the time that he was overly dramatic to add excitement to what he was about to say. He was, after all, a storyteller and a darn good one. Sam began to speak as the fire crackled, sending tiny red sparks into the pitch-black evening sky. My brothers and I used to hunt together when we were kids. He sighed heavily before continuing, but that was a long time ago. When I was a young man, having just returned home from the army, I lived here with my mother and two brothers. They've all passed on now but I remember it like it was only yesterday. He paused in reflection. His story always stood out to me because, as fantastic as it seems, I never got the inclination that he was telling me anything other than the exact truth, as he remembered it. It wasn't a story that elders told to keep kids in line. These events happened to my friend. I sunk back in the fold-out lawn chair and got comfortable. Sam would tell his story at his pace, and I did not interrupt him. This was back in the 60s, you know, Sam began. We didn't talk about the war when I got home. We never did. It was just something that happened. We did our part, and that was it. Sam paused. He was remembering. I couldn't imagine the horrors that he must have seen in Vietnam. I could tell he struggled with it and what he had to do there but he was also a proud veteran of serving his country. He told me his father served before him, and both of his brothers did as well. Though, one never made it home, and the other moved to California when he returned. They didn't hear from him much. He didn't keep in touch, and passed years earlier. Sam stood and picked up a small stick to poke at the fire. His shoulders sank. He stooped a little more as he returned to his chair and slowly lowered himself down again. I noticed the wind had died down to a mere breeze and the smoke from the fire drifted lazily into the night. The crackle of the burning wood was the only sound other than the elder's ragged breathing. When fall came, I was in the woods hunting. Every day, just me and my bow. I made my own bows and made my own arrows, too. Those were mostly hickory. Still do, Sam said, lifting his hands to look at them. As much as I can, anyway. Sam held a great sense of pride in his bow-making. He'd shown me a few of his bows over the years and told me how he made several of them. I'd be up a few hours before the sun and fix a pot of coffee before heading out into the woods. I'd hunt all day. Sometimes I'd camp down by the river or one of the creeks and stay out for a few days at a time. I wasn't ever worried about the weather. I knew how to build a shelter and make a fire. I'm an Indian, you know, he said, laughing. Sam had a great sense of humor. I was captivated by his stories. This one was no exception. I knew this was something he didn't tell many people, if any at all just from the way it began. But I wanted him to get to the good stuff quickly 
Though I held my tongue out of respect for my friend, he waited a moment to let his energy come back, and with a deep breath, he began again. That day, I hadn't planned on being gone very long, but like I said, sometimes I just stay in the woods. My mother must have heard me rustling around in the kitchen. She got up and cooked me some breakfast. She was a hard worker. Life wasn't handed to her on a silver plate, Sam said, shaking his head. No, sir. She was the strongest woman I ever knew. She didn't talk much, but when she did, you listened. And we learned to do what she told us the first time, he said, chuckling. I think she knew that I was not well yet. From the war, I mean. But she didn't know how to help me. I didn't know how, to be honest. But she could tell I was a different person then. Off in the night, I heard a coyote howl, followed by several yips. It was joined by several others a moment later. They were on the hunt. Sam cocked his head to listen. When they grew silent, he continued his story. After I ate breakfast, I gathered my things and told her that I might be out a few days. I didn't know. She just told me to be careful, and that was it. I left. No one ever worried about me. Sam shifted in his chair and reached out to warm his hands by the fire. I'm sure the warmth was soothing. I walked down the trail toward the river. It was cold that morning, but not much snow. Not yet, anyway. It was still dark when I left, but I had what we called a wheat lamp. It was a light with a strap that you adjusted to fit your head, and it ran off a battery that you carried around your waist. It lasted a long time, and it kept your hands free to carry stuff. Raccoon hunters used them. When I got to the river, I found my old John boat, threw my stuff in, and shoved off. I had a place down the river a few miles that I liked to hike to. It was just easier traveling by boat instead of climbing up and down those ridges. There's some rough country in there, he gestured to the wood. Sam stood and moved closer to the fire. He did this ever so often, though he never moved fast. He seemed restless. The sun came up, but it was just gray skies. I could see the bank on each side of the creek. There were ducks on the water that flew off when they saw me. I saw other signs that the woods were waking up. Squirrels, hawks, you know, normal stuff. I saw a couple of small deer drinking and grazing near the water's edge at one point, but I was looking for a good buck. And, to be honest, I wasn't ready to end my hunt before it even started, Sam laughed. It wasn't long before I pulled over to the other side and dragged my boat out onto the bank. The ground was frozen and covered in a thin layer of snow and ice. I fell a couple of times, but I was young then and bounced right back up. I slung my duffel on my back and started hiking. My place was way back where I used to camp with my brothers. I wanted to go there before I started hunting and set up camp. It was a few miles away, but the trails were good. He turned and looked into the darkness. That's when I first noticed the change in the weather. Sam paused long enough to stand and move closer to the fire. I took the opportunity to grab a couple more sticks and throw them on. Several embers scattered into the wind, dancing on the breeze along with a lot of smoke from the green wood. Sam did a little dance and broke into one of his songs. It didn't last long, and he didn't explain. I didn't ask. If he wanted me to know, he would have told me. Finally, he turned back and continued. The further in I got, he began, the darker it seemed to get. I guess I hadn't noticed earlier, because when you're walking around in the woods, even in the daylight, there are places where it's too dark to see. But this was different. The air was heavier, colder. Then it began snowing. I had my bow in my hand in case I saw a deer, and I walked softly. I was pretty stealthy in my youth. I'm a Cherokee warrior, Sam said, laughing. His smile stretched across his face. I could sneak my way through the middle of a buffalo herd. I laughed along at his joke, 
but I knew he meant it. The threat of snow didn't bother me. I wasn't worried at all. I think I was grateful for it. Where I had been, I never saw snow. The beauty that the great creator gives us comes in all forms. I did hurry along, though, so that I could get to where I wanted to camp and get a lean-to built. But it had been a few years since I had been in those woods, but I remembered my way and found the spot. A small creek ran nearby and fed the river with runoff from the mountain. There was an oxbow there. I found a nice clump of trees and dropped my duffel. I set about cutting some limbs and building a lean-to next to it. I had a small tarp and some rope with me. I didn't have a pup tent, but I wished I did. I remember thinking that would have been easier. Anyway, I got my shelter built and grabbed plenty of dead wood for the fire later. The snow wasn't heavy at that point, just specks of white floating down and settling on the ground. I was getting restless and decided it was time to do some hunting. I grabbed my bow and wandered down the creek and followed it upstream. I found the ridge where my brother and I would play and climb up to the top. From there, you could see for miles. There was a little clearing below where I knew there used to be a small pond. Animals would sometimes drink there while they grazed in that field. So I sneaked down the hillside, sticking to the tree line. I made it down to, then found a nice little spot hidden away where I couldn't be seen and waited. I must have just daydreamed the afternoon away because I didn't remember seeing anything. Not that first day anyway. I made my way back to my camp as it was getting dark and set about building a fire. That took the longest. It was cold and building a fire with frozen fingers was challenging, but not a problem. Did I tell you I'm an Indian? He laughed, a big drawn out laugh from deep down. His eyes gleamed in the firelight as the flames licked at the night sky. It was good to hear him laugh. After I got a fire going, I sat in the lean-to and just, I don't know, prayed a lot. Us vets back then didn't have any help when we came home. A lot of my friends turned to a bottle to cope with the war. I turned to the woods. That was my place of healing, where I felt comfortable, I guess. Safe, maybe. I had to find more wood to keep the fire going all night, but that gave me something to do and stay busy. I finally laid down and slept. I had weird dreams. Usually, they were about the war, but not on that night. I can't recall exactly what they were, but I remember they weren't of ordinary things, more like visions. Sam sighed heavily and took a deep breath. The next morning, I woke up cold. My fire burned down to cold, so I got that going again, dug through my mess kit, and made some coffee. Then I grabbed my bow and quiver, climbed over the ridge again, and headed for the clearing. Just as I got there, I saw two nice bucks step out into the open. I drew my bow and let an arrow fly before they saw me. They weren't more than 40 feet away, and I shot the closest one. It ran only a few yards away, and the other one took off back into the wood. I drew my knife and gutted my deer, threw it over my shoulder, and started making my way back to camp. And that's when I saw it for the first time. Sam locked eyes with me again. I could see he was dead serious when he spoke those following words. No more than twenty feet away on the trail that I had just come down stood a giant of a monster. Sam stood and held his arms near the fire. It had long, coarse, reddish-black hair from head to toe, reminding me of a sheepdog. It towered above me. Had to be at least eight, maybe nine feet tall, he said, reaching above his head to indicate how big it was. It stared straight at me. Its eyes were sunken and dark under a heavy brow, black and piercing, but red all around, bloodshot. Its head sloped and its muscles were so big that it didn't have a neck. Its nose spread across its face, and I could see the nostrils flaring and the pink inside. 
His mouth was huge and stretched from one side of his massive jaw to the other, and the lips were like that of a horse. I was on the edge of my seat listening. I whispered, Sasquatch, under my breath. Sam heard me. Yes, but at that time, I had never heard of Bigfoot or Sasquatch or anything like that. Other than a few old stories about monsters in the woods, I had no idea. I'm not sure how long we stood there facing each other before I realized why. It dawned on me that I was carrying its dinner. I nodded at it. I nodded at the deer on my shoulder, then slid it down to the ground and slowly backed away. When I was far away enough, it walked over to the deer, picked it up in one hand, then stepped into the woods and disappeared. It never took its eyes off me. What did you do next? I asked, unable to hold back. We heard the coyotes start up again, but they sounded much further away this time. Sam cocked his head as if to listen to their mournful cries. His head dipped again, and he stared into the flame. I sank to my knees and cried, he confessed. I'm not ashamed, but I cried. I cried like a baby. Fear is a powerful emotion. It has a way of bringing up your deepest feelings. It was overpowering. It was not because of the creature, but about the war and the things I saw there, the things I did that I didn't want to do. It all came crashing down on me. I remembered everything, from the time I got on the plane, being dropped from a Huey in the middle of a firefight, seeing my buddies die, missing home, everything. I could see their faces. I remembered how scared I was when I was there and how thankful I was to make it back home, he said. He sat there a moment and collected his thoughts before continuing. My mind was numb to it all, and after a while, I stopped knowing anyone. Oh, I knew their names, but I would never let myself know them closely because I knew that I would probably lose them. I didn't want to carry that. I felt guilty for that, like I had dishonored them by not getting to know them. Sam paused again. I didn't want to push him, so I sat quietly. I guess I must have sat there in the snow for several minutes before I picked myself up and hiked back to camp. I was drained, no energy left, but I felt like there was nothing left inside weighing on me, like a burden was lifted from me. Relieved, I built my fire back up and just sat there. I wasn't thinking. I suppose I was scared when I first saw the monster, but that passed quickly. After it left with the deer, I wasn't afraid, not anymore. I never got the sense that I should be. I only got a sense that I had interrupted his hunt and that I owed him. And I knew it was a him, no mistaking that. Did you pack up and get the heck out? I asked. No, not right away. I stayed another night. As I said, I wasn't scared. I was at peace. I think, somehow, the creature helped me find the healing that I needed. And to be honest, I wasn't sure if what I had witnessed was real or not. I had a lot of self-doubt. I thought I was going through something that I couldn't explain, visions or something. I didn't know, but I wasn't afraid. The following day, I packed up and started the hike out. By nightfall, I made it to the river and found my boat. I threw my duffel in, laid my bow on top, and then slid it out into the water. The wind was blowing hard and whipping through the trees, blowing snow everywhere. The water was white capping, very choppy, and I had to try to paddle against the current. I knew this wasn't going to be a fun trip. I pulled my boat back to me with the rope and started to step in when I lost my balance on the icy bank and slid into the water. Then I was scared. What did you do? I struggled to get back on the bank. I couldn't get a handhold on anything, and the current was too strong. The boat took off down the river, and I didn't have a chance to grab onto it. Not that I could have anyway. I just knew for sure I was a goner. The water was too cold, and I didn't have the strength left. I let go and felt myself float away with the current. I remember thinking that was my favorite bow. 
I'd carved an eagle into the riser, my best work. It's funny what goes through a person's mind when facing death. A feeling of peace came over me, and I stopped shaking. I had no regrets. I had a good life. I only felt sorry for my mother, who would never know what happened to her son. Sam suddenly scrambled to his feet and danced next to the fire again. He sang a few words. I didn't understand, but maybe he was giving praise. When he finished, he sat back down. I was dying to ask him more questions, but I didn't dare speak. The great spirit was taking me, and I just let go. With everything, mind, spirit, body, I just let go. Sam stopped and caught his breath. His sudden burst of energy had zapped his strength, or it seemed like it did. But a moment later, he continued. I woke up next to a roaring fire. I had no idea how I got there or even how long I had been there. It was daytime, and that's about all I knew. My clothes were dry, so it had to be hours anyway. I looked around, confused. Everything was like a whirlwind in my head. I didn't recognize where I was, not right away. I guess I hadn't eaten anything in a while, just some coffee is all I remember having. Maybe I wasn't right in the head because of it. I don't know. When I stood and looked around the camp, I smelled something. I wasn't sure what it was, but it smelled good. Then I saw what it was. In the fire, I saw the tail of a fish sticking out from between two planks of wood that were tied together with string or vine or something. I didn't question it, not once. I ripped it out of the fire and ate like a starving man. It was the best meal I've ever eaten. It was so good, he laughed. After I ate, I looked around the area. What I found was interesting. There were three long branches on the ground near the fire. Sam used the stick he was poking the fire with and drew the shape on the ground, kind of like a capital letter T that had an extra cross in it. In the bottom, outside of the T, was a stack of three rocks and there were enormous footprints all around, twice as big as mine and barefoot. Sam had my attention now. I've heard of this kind of thing before, I said. The sticks and rocks, I mean? At the time, I had no idea what it meant. I don't think it was meant for me. What do you think it meant? You think it was a message to the others that may find you or something? I asked. Yes, I think it left it so that the others that may come upon me knew that I was to be left alone. Maybe it meant friend. I didn't know, and I still don't, but I was grateful. I felt he didn't mind me talking and asking questions. I could read the sign when the time came that he was annoyed with me or didn't want to be disturbed when he was speaking. He wasn't giving me any indication of that, not yet anyway. So, what happened then, I asked. When I looked around a little more, I discovered that I was in a familiar place and not too far off the trail, only steps from the river and on the right side. Even though it had been four or five years since I had been there, it all came back to me like riding a bike. Someone or something dragged my boat up on the bank. My pack was right where I'd left it, but my bow and quiver of arrows were gone. You think the Sasquatch took it? Of that, I have no doubt. I think it was a trade for my life, and one I'd gladly do again. I think he got took on the deal, he laughed. But it was my best bow after all. After I ate my fill, I grabbed my duffel and hiked home. It took me the rest of the day. I finally walked into the house just as it got dark. My mother asked, no dear. I just shrugged my shoulders but said nothing. She had to see that I no longer carried my bow, but said nothing. Maybe she knew. Did you ever see it again? I asked. The Bigfoot, I mean. I hunted every year since, hiked all over these mountains, never seen it again or any sign of what happened was real. I never got the feeling of being afraid, and sometimes I felt that I wasn't alone. Maybe it was the creator's way of cleansing me spiritual healing. Sam was tired. I helped him back to the house and made sure he was comfortable. 
I went back outside and put the fire out before turning in. I couldn't sleep that night. I lay awake thinking about my friend's story. I had no reason to disbelieve him. Sam permitted me to invite a friend to do some camping with me and explore the area of his encounter. I have camped, hunted, and ridden four-wheelers for many years all over those mountains where Sam grew up. The Kimachis are full of wildlife. Gray foxes, coyotes, bobcats, turkeys, bears, even mountain lions. Fish are plentiful in the creeks and rivers. There have also been many reported sightings of Bigfoot. Though I have combed these mountains, crisscrossing ridges, hunting deer, and fishing those backwater creeks and ponds, I've never actually seen a Sasquatch. I did have a bit of scare one late evening. I learned that Sam had passed away not long ago, which brought a considerable amount of sadness to me. I did talk to his eldest son Richard on the phone when Sam passed. It was a brief conversation, but one very profound. Richard said, Dad spoke of you often, said you were a good friend. He would want you to know of his passing, but we just now came across your number. He wanted to leave you something to remember him by. I think I said something like, I'm very sorry to hear that. I considered Sam a good friend too, and will miss him. My deepest condolences. But what do you mean he left me something? I was curious about that. I knew Sam wasn't a wealthy man, and he didn't have much of anything. I was shocked and more than a bit confused, consumed with sadness. I didn't know what to think. Richard said, it's a bow. Dad was known as a good bow maker, but this one, I don't recognize. It's old, and it looks like it's seen better days. Probably not worth much other than to Dad, but he wanted you to have it. It has an eagle carved into it. I wouldn't suggest stringing it up, though. It could break. Richard continued. When Dad was sick, the hospice worker said it was on the front porch leaning against the door one morning when she got there. When I asked him about it, he said an old friend he had gifted it to must have brought it back to him in the night. He never said who, Richard said. That's when he said that he wanted you to have it, and said you'd know why. I hung the bow on the wall in my office. Every time I look at it, I'm reminded of my friend, Sam, his stories, and the bonds of friendship in all its forms. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!